Hi, it's Dr. Steve Albrecht, and welcome to the Library Service Safety and Security Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Library 2.0 and produced by the founder of Library 2.0, Steve Hargadon. My topic for this half hour is a continuation of our conversation from the last podcast, Management Tools, Techniques, Tips, and Ideas for New Library Supervisors, New Library Managers, and Longtime Library Managers and Supervisors. I want to talk about some ideas for managers and supervisors in the library facilities to think about when interacting with their subordinate employees, people that work for them. If you're a brand new supervisor, you may have some concerns about how you interact with your employees about making sure you're doing the right thing on their behalf and on behalf of the facility. If you're a longtime supervisor, maybe there's some tools for your toolkit that you can apply here and listen to from me and then uh, um, turn around and apply to your situations or mentor and teach new supervisors that are coming up in the library as well. If you're an employee who wants to be a supervisor one day, then this discussion is for you as well. One of the things I think about a lot in my coaching conversations is my careful use of behaviors to describe things that I want to see the employee make changes in instead of labels. And here, the distinction is clear, should be clear, which is to stop using labels like you're always late, or you've got a lousy attitude, or you're not very good at customer service, or something that's really negative like that, and switch it around to behaviors. I noticed last week that when you came in, you clocked in 15 minutes late. Let's talk about attendance, and let's talk about our attendance policy. I noticed that when you were finishing up with the patron that you got a little sarcastic at the end when you said this, this, and this. I noticed that in the last staff meeting that you seemed disengaged and you were looking at your phone and you didn't help out in terms of the conversation and kind of left abruptly. Is something going on? What, what can we talk about to make sure that I know that if there's any issues we need to talk about, Let's do it now. So those are typical behavior-based issues, performance-based issues that we sometimes, I guess perhaps as shorthand or as ways to to speed things up in our own mind or to to capture the issue and the conversation with the employee, we use labels. You're always, you never, you do this, you do that. And we describe these things in label basis. And think about the, the basic six or seven things that we talk to employees in coaching conversations about performance, behavior, attitude, service skills, teamwork skills, attendance, following policies and procedures. Now, each of those things is pretty broad-based and has a lot of discussion points inside of each each of them. But when we look at them specifically, the function in our conversation here in terms of this idea is how do we make these things behavior-based? How do we make these things performance-based that are connected to what we have seen, what we have... uh, observed with the employee, not necessarily using labels to demean them or to diminish what they're trying to do or to talk down to them or be condescending. So when we th- say things in, in sweeping generalizations, you're always, you never, um, the employee says, well, yes, I do. And they know inside their mind that that's not correct. So when we say you're always late or you seem to have a lousy attitude, they know when we make generalizations like that that they're, that's not correct. Sometimes they are exactly on time, and sometimes they are um, exactly um, perfect in terms of their interactions with patrons. So think about those conversations that you want to have that are coaching conversations, whether it's down the hallway as you're walking place to place, you know, in a confidential conversation, in a, uh, just a discussion over a cup of coffee, uh, in your office, walking and talking somewhere on the library floor, that we focus on behavior and performance-based issues that you have either seen, observed, witnessed, or heard about from a reliable source, and that we turn those things into, into conversations about the fix rather than the label. We use the label-based language kind of as a shorthand, and what it does is it, it, it makes the employee feel attacked, especially when we generalize about things that they know they're not actually doing all the time. And so when you say you're always late, they're not going to say you're, you're right. What they're thinking to themselves is, well, I was, there, I was on time yesterday and I was on time the day before that. I may have been a few minutes late today. So stick to specific examples, things that you can clarify, quantify, point to, and, and make sure they're recent as well. Nobody likes to be dragged through the, the ringer in terms of uh, some performance or behavior issue that happened six months ago. We don't have to address it five seconds after it happened, unless it's severe or really 
obvious and not good for the business. But after a meeting or after you see it and you wait a little bit of time for the Portland person to decide and have a, a polite private conversation, then you're catching them fairly early on in the process. And that's when the issue is still top of mind for you and top of mind for them or should be top of mind for them. So again, the tip or the technique here is behaviors, not labels. I talked last time about meeting behavior, and I think I may have foreshadowed a concept I want you to remember and be able to teach, which is called the PIN technique, positive, interesting, and negative, P-I-N. The PIN technique is my antidote, our antidote, your antidote, for idea killers. And we define idea killers as people in meetings who shoot down good ideas, who as soon as the idea has left the launching pad, so to speak, or taken off from the airport, they gun it down. They shoot it down. And they say things like, that's a stupid idea, or we don't do that around here, or you're new, and we tried that and it didn't work, or it's not in the budget. And you know, once you've been here a long time like I have, you'll know that that stuff doesn't work, and so why bother even bringing it up? That's kind of the idea killer taken to the extreme. And I have seen versions of this, and so perhaps of you in your, in your career as an employee, especially as a supervisor manager, we have an opportunity and an obligation, I believe, to stop this type of idea killing conversation killers, these, these idea killers, uh, stop them in their tracks and to do it in a polite way during the meeting and say, okay, uh, uh, Sue, um, okay, Dave, um, I, I hear what you're saying. I think we have to wait for this idea to be fleshed out before we can decide. I'd rather not leap to judgment here on this until we've talked about it a little bit more. So let's hold off on that and let's get back to the idea itself. That's a polite way to do it. I think what you do is you pull the person aside after the meeting and say, look, I've noticed that, and we're back to behaviors. When people come up with new ideas, especially during staff meetings or brainstorming conversations or problem solving meetings, that you're quick to shoot it down. You say stuff like, that won't work, or what a stupid idea, and you demean the other person, and you make them feel bad for having a fresh idea or even a novel idea. And, I, you know, I think parenthetically from our perspective, one of the things that makes the brainstorming process, the, the idea generation meetings, so much fun and so useful is sometimes people will mention or discuss something or bring up something, an individual employee, who hasn't been there that long and comes up with a genius idea. Or somebody who, who is, has been thinking about this particular issue or problem that we're working on and comes up with a solution which sounds kind of goofy, but then when we flesh it out and we look at kind of the hard edges and, and the boundaries, it turns out to be a really good idea. We've just have to figure out how to implement it. So think about things that sounded sort of goofy in the first pass, and after a little touch-up, a little bit of editing, a little bit of discussion, a little bit of follow-through, it turns out to be a pretty good idea that we can actually put into practice. When I think about the idea killer, there's some condescension going on there. There's some know-it-all-ism. There's a little bit of, I'm smarter than you are. Um, I've seen employees do this, and the ideas are coming from the bosses, which is not a great career move. But typically, I see it where an employee who brings up an idea, maybe fairly new to the organization or new to the department, and gets shot down, what the message they hear is, well, uh, creativity and ingenuity and, and, and good thinking is not rewarded here, so I'm not going to say anything. And oftentimes the idea killer can be somebody whose personality is really dominant in the meeting and dominant outside the meeting. And as a result, they sort of bully people into not saying anything. So people look at their phones or they scratch notes on a piece of paper and they look around the room and they don't say anything because they don't want to go through the engagement, the back and forth with the idea killer. A couple things. One, let's talk about the positive, interesting, and negative technique as a way to structure and, and run your meetings. And two, you have to have the courage with a capital C to pull your idea killers aside in private and say, stop doing that. It's not good for business. Now, one of the end results of that discussion with them as part of a coaching conversation is that they pout. And you see it in the next meeting where they just don't say anything and they sigh and they look around the room and and they act like you've wounded them because you won't let them speak. That's not it at all. What you say to them is, I do want to hear your ideas. However, I want you to be careful not to shoot down the fledgling, the new, the, the creative, outside-the-box idea that you hear that may not sound like what we would do around here, but may turn out to be something we actually do attempt. So I want you to give it some life, not be an idea killer, not say those typical things that, that you have been saying and, and delineate what those things are, and then go back and see what their meeting behavior is and reward them, the idea killers, when they don't idea kill during the meetings and reward them and say, hey, thanks for your input on that. Jane, your, your idea was terrific. 
Larry, um, I like your feedback of when, when uh, Pedro said this, or when you think about people in the meeting environment, especially newer employees, especially employees who may be at lower levels in the organization, may certainly feel bullied in the meeting discussion, not about having the courage to say their thoughts and ideas about things because they just don't want to be shot down. And so as a result, we get sort of what we always get, which is the same old ideas from the same old people, or there's no creativity of thought or creativity of, of, of discussion where we come up with some unusual or novel approaches to things. So let's talk about the pin technique, positive, interesting, and negative. And this is something my dad, Carl Albrecht, taught me many years ago, and I try to, when I'm running meetings, um, and especially team building discussions, brainstorming discussions, things like that, I really try to enforce this, and I explain it to the group beforehand, and I foreshadow it before the meeting happens, so we don't have the idea killer I issue where we have to sort of catch them while they're idea killing. The way to explain the positive, interesting, and negative, or pin technique to the group is simply say, look, um, I want your best ideas. And sometimes we have to take a risk as a group and as individual group members when we say something. And I want this to be a free discussion where we can brainstorm. And you can explain the concept of brainstorming, which has come from a guy named Robert uh, or, um, uh, uh, Osborne, not Robert Osborne. Um, uh, I think it's David Osborne. Um, anyway, a guy named Osborne, who came up with the concept of brainstorming, which said this is a, he worked for an advertising agency called Batten, Barton, Durston, and Osborne. And the running joke back in those days, I think it was in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s, was Batten, Barton, Durston, and Osborne sounds like a steamer trunk falling down a flight of stairs. Osborne said in the brainstorming process, the first step is the development of a number of ideas, half-baked, half, half not all the way thought out through, just throw it on the wall and see what sticks, but lots of ideas. The second step is to go through the, uh, those ideas and sort of prioritize them and say, what do they look like where well, this goes over here and this may make better sense in this piece of it over here and this could be this part of the solution over here. Then the third part is to, is to analyze those and to prioritize them based on which ones you think could happen and which ones you think are the strongest. Notice that the Evaluation step is like the third step and not the, not the first. And so the, for the idea killer, for people who are, are short of patience and time and, and feel sort of tired about the discussion process, they, they go right to the evaluation right away. One of the conversations I had with my father back in, in the day where I was teaching a program for him called Brain Power based on a book and a video that he did, Brain Power, was the difference between divergent thinking versus convergent thinking. Divergent thinking is where we diverge on a solution. And, and we have multiple conversations about divergent thought, right? So divergent thought is broad-based. So we diverge on several solutions, on not just one. Convergent thinking, by the way, is where we converge on one. So if you look at divergent versus convergent thinking, divergent thinking is the world of possibilities, lots of ideas. Convergent thinking is one. If you were to engage in divergent and convergent thinking with your colleagues about lunch, you would say, well, what do you think about lunch today? Chinese, Thai, maybe we go to a pizza place, maybe we go to that new buffet across the street. You're engaging there in divergent thinking, world of possibilities, right? And then someone says, well, the, the pizza place is closest, and I was kind of thinking about how that might taste good, so why don't we try pizza, and everybody agrees that we've converged on pizza. Divergent thinking, world of possibilities, convergent thinking, just focus on one. Now... If you are overly divergent, you can spend all day coming up with ideas that never get anywhere. If you're overly divergent, you can come up with ideas that, that, that you talk to death. Sometimes in life and in work, we have to converge on something. If we are overly convergent, which unfortunately most of the population, most of the work population is overly convergent, um, social media has made us overly convergent, the news media has made us overly convergent because we tend to think in terms of yes, no, do, not do, kind of answers to things instead of fleshing them out. Being overly convergent in the world we live in now, especially in, in the work environment, is that we are too quick to make value judgments about one idea and put all our energy into that one idea, and then when it doesn't do well or it fails, we have problems. You can be overly divergent, waste time. We don't come up with a solution we need to, uh, to apply. But I rarely see that. What I mostly see is overly convergent thinking, which is we, we dive to a solution, just one, without much discussion and without much brainstorming. Think about this. Have you ever been to a brainstorming meeting where there was no brainstorming? The boss comes in and says, here's what we're going to do, and then we end up doing it because that's what he or she wants. Or 
the strongest member of the group who could be bullying the other members, including the boss, bullying the boss into into this sort of persuasion piece where they say, here's what we think, I think we ought to do, we end up doing that even though nobody wants to. If we look at the brainstorming process, it is highly divergent at the beginning and then convergent at the end. And that's the important step is to keep that order correct. Same with the positive, interesting, and negative technique, which is first, and this is what we say to the group, we will focus on what is positive about the ideas that we are discussing. Let's say we're trying to do something about improving uh, some library circulation issue. So let's talk about all the things and make a list first, either on the easel pad or have someone capture the list as a scribe. Let's make a list of all the things that are positive about this new plan or approach that we're going to try. Let's say we're going to do solution Z, and that's what we've, we've figured out. Let's, let's figure out all the good things about solution Z. The second part is interesting. Who's going to pay for it? What's the budget? Is there a training issue? Do we have to create a cheat sheet or a template? How do we get people to understand it? How do we train the patrons? How do we train our staff? Whatever the issues are. Those are the interesting parts, and they're pretty neutral, right? The third step, and this is the one where the idea killers can sort of unfurl their wings, is what we don't like about it. Here's the negative, what we don't like about it. It's expensive, it's time consuming, it, it'd be hard to get approval for it from the library board, whatever it happens to be. When I teach this as a training program example, I will use putting a casino on an airplane. So I say, okay, let's, let's take Southwest Airlines or Delta or American or United, or let's put an uh, a casino in the back of the airplane. What do you like about it? What's positive about it? And people say, well, it's, it's interesting and it passes the time and you can learn to gamble and you, maybe you could win lots of money and you meet new people and you can drink and it, it makes the flight go by quicker and, and maybe when you get to where you're going, you have picked up some money and a new skill and so on and on we go with the positive. Interesting. Well, I guess, you know, who's going to pay for the installation of the equipment and do we have to have a, a staff and how do we handle the money part and it's all electronic and... Can you do a roulette wheel with a real, real roulette ball while the plane is bouncing around the skies? And what about turbulence? And, and, and you know, there's some security issues. And uh, you know, how do we keep from being hacked? And things like that. those are the interesting parts. The interesting part is the facts and figures. And oftentimes, it's very neutral. Then the third step, of course, is the negative. What don't we like about it? It's noisy. It makes the plane unbalanced. Uh, maybe there's drunks. Maybe people get upset and they're angry. Maybe the, the tickets to the, on the airplane are very expensive now because we've, we've taken out a number of seats. Lots of things that can be negative on this issue. Probably more negatives on this because human beings have that kind of tendency than positives. But look at the approach. Here is the potential solution in our library for some circulation thing. This is what we decided we're going to do. Let's talk about what we like about it first, what's interesting about it, facts and figures, neutral, second, and then third, what we don't like about it couple things. One, we have it backwards. Most of the time we start with a negative. And if we have any energy left over in, at the end, we'll, we'll focus on the positive. That doesn't always work. The second thing is when we look at positive, interesting, and negative, sometimes people will have a fair amount of energy about the good things, what they like about it, the positive, in the beginning. And then by the time they get to the end, the negative, they have less energy and we have a shorter list. I'm okay with that. I, we can always find what's wrong with things. But I think it's, it's, it's important to look and say, Positive in the beginning tends to be a longer list. Negative in the beginning tends to be a longer list. And if we have any energy left over at the end, it tends to be, for the positive, tends to be a shorter list. If we flip that around, by, by definition, we can get a more well-rounded collection of the positives, what we like about these ideas or this particular idea. What's interesting about it is who's going to pay for it and what's in the budget and how much it's going to cost and how do we do it. And then the third part is the negative tends to be a shorter list. It takes courage for you with a capital C to enforce the concept of positive, interesting, and negative. But you do it by starting out with your meetings by just reminding folks about this. Blame me if you want to say, I came up with this new concept, or Albrecht did, or I heard about this, and say, I want to try this for our meetings. I want your feedback, but I want it in order. I want your feedback, but I want it in using this kind of structure. Positive first, interesting second, negative third. Try it in your meetings and see how it works. You may have to have a little touch-ups, a few occasional reminders. But this, from my experience, and maybe for yours as well, is the best antidote to dealing with idea killers, especially for those people who just won't stop bashing the, the fledgling ideas that people come up with in meetings. Speaking of meetings, one of my colleagues is a fan of something called the odd starting and stopping time. 
So instead of saying the meeting's at 9, the meeting starts at 9.13 and goes to 9.43. What we've discovered in life is that people will tend to, maybe curiously, come to meetings where it starts at 9.13. and Because when you say 9, that means 9-ish to them. But 9.13 means that's when we start. Uh, one of my uh, uh, mentor bosses back in the day was a bold enough cat that he would lock the door and say, you've missed the meeting, get the notes from somebody else if they came in past the starting time. Now, that's a little school, school, you know, K through 12 school-ish for me. But if you have the courage to do it for people that show up late for your meetings, what you say to everybody is these, th these meetings are important. Our time is important. We need to come on time, finish on time, and get back to work. So give this a try. Say the meeting is at 8.13 and ends at 8.43. And one of the other parts of the odd starting and stopping time, which we've learned from the movie theater business and from the airline business. Planes don't leave at 10. They leave at 10.08 or 10.12, something like that. Same as movies, right? What, what we can do is use a time-based agenda. And the time-based agenda says we will spend 15 minutes on issue A, 10 minutes on issue B, and 5 minutes on issue C. Um, new business will be discussed if we have 5 minutes at the end, and that's what we'll do. We're going to use a time-based agenda. Let's say you have 30 minutes for a meeting, which from my perspective, unless the meeting is super critical and a brainstorming meeting, 30 minutes to 45 minutes is a pretty good chunk of time. Most people in terms of, of how much they want to spend in their concentration and how much coffee they've drank and things like that, 30 to 45 minutes is a good, a good chunk of time to get something done. Not every meeting has to be an hour. And in that time span, we follow a time-based agenda. That keeps people from wandering off the topic. It keeps people from making speeches. It keeps people from, from going off into, into other divergent territories, which is off the topic of the issue. So we say for 15 minutes, we're going to talk about this issue, 10 minutes for this issue, five minutes for this one, and we'll recap with five minutes of questions or whatever, or next steps for the next meeting. So think about that approach, a time-based agenda, not just an agenda that says we're going to talk about these three or four things, but have a time-based agenda. Um, I used to go to this HR association meeting, and they used a time-based agenda. And so we would start at, at the stroke of 12 and finish at the stroke of 1 o'clock, and we'd eat our lunches as we went through the meeting, and people got out of there right on time. Think about all the meetings that you have went to where the time gets wasted, and this time-based agenda can tighten things up pretty dramatically. One of the things that I, I continue to be disappointed at personally and professionally in life and in work is listening skills of people around me. I have lots of conversations with people that I care about, and they're looking at their phones, or they're watching TV, or they're looking at something at work on a computer screen, and they're not paying attention to what I'm saying, and my magical words don't get into their ears. Think of the number of times you've had to repeat yourself and say things over and over again to employees who just aren't listening to you. I think there's a, a, a substantial concern in our world about the distraction techniques that social media and, and our cell phone creators have used to get us looking at our phones all the time. And I think as a result, people have lost the art of listening. So think about what active listening means to you. It's eye contact. It's turning towards the person. It's taking notes. It's, it's saying things like, I hear you, and thanks for telling me about that, and let's talk about it a little bit more, and let's dive into that. And, and you have those conversational cues which say, I'm paying attention to what's going on. I think you can model active listening for sure. You can also use active listening as a coaching conversation with employees who aren't doing it very well. And I would think as, as you know, it gets into a severe range where it's affecting the employee's performance and, or behavior at work, that it becomes a performance evaluation issue. Not just you need to be a better listener, but here are some active listening techniques that you use in coaching or as part of the performance evaluation process to say to people, I have an expectation that you're going to pay attention to instructions, to, to assignments, to delegated tasks, to the way patrons talk to you over the phone or face-to-face, -to, -face, to the way supervisors talk to you or elected officials, whoever you come in contact with. Stop looking at your phone. Stop looking at the screen all the time. Stop trying to split your intentions and your attention, right, your intention and your attention, attention, with things that are interfering with your ability to listen all the way through. So active listening is a big part of, of coaching skills for sure, and I think we need a refresher as we go forward in life with all these phones and screens. Praise. Praise is a big part of coaching. It's a big part of being a supervisor. It's a big part of being a human being. And I think about praise in our world, and I think of the acronyms that I, I'm uh, kind of a mnemonic that I'm reminded about, which is soon, sincere, and specific. Those are the three S's, right? Soon, we do it right as we catch somebody doing something on our behalf or on behalf of the patron. Sincere, you know, not we don't say things like, you didn't screw up as much as you usually do. We don't say things like that. We're not condescending. We're, we're, we're 
using the right kind of tone and body language when we say, you know, good job, Kate, not, yeah, good job, Kate. I mean, we don't use that kind of approach, right? We're not condescending. We're not, we're not dismissive when we use praise. We're sincere. And then the third is specific, not just, hey, thanks, but hey, I appreciate the way you handled that patron situation. That was kind of a, kind of a shouting match that they started with. You were calm. You were collected. You got, got through and you solved their problems. I appreciate what you're doing on our behalf. Thanks for modeling the kind of service we, we like to do around here. So soon, sincere, and specific is the, the S's and then the P's are positive, personal, and proactive. Positive means that we point out things that are good for the business, that we like to see in employees. And the, the personal means you and me, not just we or us or the royal we, right? Say thanks for what you do for our department, and it makes me as a supervisor proud of the work that you're doing. And then the last one, proactive means that you look for as a supervisor, as a manager, ways to catch people doing the right thing. And, and the, the other part about praise, whether it's the, the three S's or the three P's, is that we can also say to employees, you can do this for each other. You don't need to be a boss to praise people. You can be a, super, a supervisor and praise people, but you can also be an employee and catch people doing good things on your behalf as a coworker and as a colleague and say, thanks for helping me with that thing with my boss and thanks for getting that patron off my back. I appreciate it. So look for ways to demonstrate praise. Look for ways to demonstrate public praise. We, we tend to see with people that, that when we praise them in public, there tends to be a really strong connection to feeling valued and appreciated and, and prideful about the work they do for, on behalf of the organization and for the organization. One of the things when I think about the coaching conversation is, is I look at ways to sort of ceremonialize the wrap up. And I have talked about this in the previous podcast. But, but really this idea of making sure that this person has the ability to tell you when he or she needs more than what you have given them as a potential solution. So you say, is there anything that we need to discuss? Are there any obstacles? As you look at this, when I turn you loose on this particular project or this particular coaching problem solving thing that we've just talked about, which is performance or behavior or policy or or whatever it happens to be, is there anything holding you back from being successful? Is there anything I need to know? Is there anything I need to do for you? Is there any training or is there anything? Because if you say no, then I'm going to assume that based on what we have talked about, you have the tools and the ability to do what I want you to do. If the answer is yes, then let's fine tune what I need to do for you. Now, I have talked in many discussions for Library 2.0 about not asking a lot of yes, no questions because we don't want you just yes, no answers. You know, when you say to somebody, do you know the delegated tasks you're supposed to do, they're always going to say yes. And when you say to somebody, do you have any questions, they're always going to say no because they don't want to be embarrassed. But I think you have to have, ask that closing question, that series of closing questions in coaching. Is there anything that's pre preventing you from doing the work that we're talking about? Is there any obstacles that you see that I need to know about to help you with that can prevent you from doing what we, I want you to do? Is there anything that's stopping you from getting to work on time starting at 9 o'clock in the morning? Those types of specific yes-no questions. And you document your question and you document their answer. So you can go back later and say, you know, two weeks ago we talked about this and you said there were no issues and yet here the same problem is again and we definitely have an issue. So that gets us into either more coaching or you reach the crossroads, in which case you say no more coaching. The, last, the next conversation we have is going to be related to discipline. Last thing to talk about in this, in this conversation, tools and techniques, is rituals, rewards, ceremonies, and celebrations. Rituals, rewards, ceremonies, and celebrations. And I'm, I'm big on rituals and rewards. I like a, a sturdy work culture. I came from a very strong work culture uh, with a lot of traditions built into it. Uh, people in the military have very strong traditions and work and part of their work culture. What are the things that are connected to your library that are part of your work culture? We've been in this building for 50 years, and, and you know the, the people that founded this library you know, or go back to the 1800s, whatever it happens to be, there's a strong cultural work history connection, and what do we do to ritualize that? Um, what kind of rewards do we give employees, not just for, you know, at nice job, good, good going, but, but kind of rewards that could be, uh, you know, cash bonuses or gift cards or Amazon cards, things like that. Think about what we can do just out of petty cash, or we've got a little teeny slush fund that we can pull from to give people uh, who do good things on our behalf a little reward, especially in front of their, their peers and colleagues. What kind of ceremonies do we have? Promotion ceremonies, retirement ceremonies. What kind of celebrations do we do? Birthdays, work anniversaries, uh, promotions that, you know, someone's, uh, you know, if you have a probationary period where they're off probation as an employer, off probation as a supervisor, something like that. 
think about those things kind of fall through the cracks sometimes. And we think we should have done something on this person's behalf or we should have done something on behalf of the team or the department. Rituals, rewards, ceremonies, celebrations. Pick those things which can be ceremonialized. Pick those things where we can reward employees. Pick those things where we can capture a moment in time with photos and cake and, and, and presents or whatever happens to be for somebody's birthday because we want to say and do the right thing on their behalf and to say, look, as human beings, we are all in this together. We want to be successful together and we want to reward you for what you have done on our behalf or capture a moment in your life, your career, your promotion, your retirement, your birthday, whatever happens to be that's meaningful for you and meaningful for us. So thanks for listening today for the Library Service Security and Safety Podcast. I'm Dr. Steve Albrecht. Uh, my thanks to the producer of the Library Service Safety and Security Podcast, Steve Argadon. For more information, visit the Library 2.0 website at library20.com. Until next time, I will talk to you later and have a safe day.